History and Criminology Project, in conjunction with the Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences, is pleased to present a conversation with Robert Bob M. Bohm. Uh, it's March 22nd, 2017. We're coming to you uh, from, this is your hometown? Yes. Hometown of Kansas City, Missouri, or Missouri, as <laughs> usually sometimes known to uh, alliterate. Uh, first, a brief introduction. Uh, oh, oh, I was on a tangent there, as we are wont to do in the uh, Academy. We're at the uh, Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences meetings here uh, in 2017. Brief introduction to Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Bohm's career, and then we'll segue into the substance of his career, uh, some of the highlights. Uh, so, uh, began his education uh, at the University of Missouri, uh, Columbia, obtaining a, a degree in psychology, an undergraduate degree in psychology in 1972. From there, he uh, went into the University of Missouri at Kansas City, uh, pursued a degree in secondary education, uh, while simultaneously holding down a position at, uh, at the local uh, county jail. I uh, hope to get into some of that, uh, that story here. Before uh, going off to Florida State University studying criminology, already getting his PhD in 1980, held a variety of different academic positions over the course of, uh, over the course of his career, beginning at Jackson State University. Jacksonville State. Jacksonville State, thank you. College of Criminal Justice, uh, fortunate enough at that point in time to earn a position, despite not having uh, finished his, uh, his formal studies, uh, in 1979 hired on ABD, then named associate professor in 1982, tenured in 1984. At that point, he departed in 1989 from Jacksonville State University to the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. Uh, named full professor in 1992 at the University of uh, Carolina, North Carolina, Charlotte. Uh, then moving to his current home at the University of Central Florida in 1995. Uh, in 2016, he was named Professor Emeritus in the Department of Criminal Justice and Legal Studies. Over the course of his career, he's earned a number of distinctions from the Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences. We'll tick them off here accordingly. Served as president of the organization the 30th year, uh, 1992 to 93. Named Academy Fellow in 1999. The Founders Award was bestowed upon him in the year 2001, and most recently, in 2008, he earned the uh, Bruce Smith uh, Senior Award, uh, which is actually kind of interesting. It's, it's a nice segue. Uh, your Bruce Smith uh, Senior Award address was very biographical, yes. kind of outlined some of the highlights. Uh, I wonder if you could maybe distill down for uh, our viewers some of the highlights that brought you uh, in the line of progression up to the door of Florida State University? Well, um, first of all, I should say that serendipity played a big role in uh, <laughs> my academic career. Um, when I graduated uh, with my bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Missouri in 1972, uh, I went to work for uh, one of my father's friends who owned a automobile radio and stereo store, both uh, wholesale and retail. And I managed one of his stores for about seven months and frankly hated it. Uh, I hated dealing uh, with the uh, car dealers and uh, basically uh, the retail trade. Uh, they used the bait and switch method of uh, advertising, which I usually didn't even know about uh, when the ad came out. And so uh, I decided that this wasn't going to be my career. Um, after that, uh, I was searching for something else to do. And I was living uh, in a, uh, an apartment on 39th and Warwick, which is frankly not too far from where we are now uh, in uh, mid Kansas City. And on the corner of my street was a 7 Eleven store that uh, had. Uh, tons of kids around all day and all night long. They probably skipped school, and that's what this was their meeting place. Realizing that they really needed something to do, I decided that I'd open a penny arcade in the area. So I was able to rent a storefront uh, just off 39th and Main in Kansas City. And uh, I was able to rent it for $200 a month, which was about all of my savings at that time. 
And um, I only signed a month-to-month -month tenancy because I didn't know whether it would make good or not, and I didn't want to be stuck with a lease that I couldn't afford to pay. So I thought the month-to-month -month tenancy was a, was a good proposition. Then I contacted an amusement company, and they agreed to fill my storefront with arcade games. Uh, we had uh, uh, six uh, coin-operated pool tables. In those days, it was a quarter to play. Uh, we had foosball and air hockey tables. Uh, we had uh, uh, several uh, pinball machines and other arcade games. Well, we filled this storefront uh, with, this, uh, with these uh, uh, arcade uh, uh, games, and um, we had a deal where the amuse this amusement company would supply the machines and would service them and rotate new machines in for the, and replace the old machines, and we would split the profits 50-50. So uh, from the moment that I opened the door, I started making a profit. I made over $200 on the first night I was open. Place was packed. I, did, I, I couldn't believe how many quarters came out of these machines. And what we would do twice a week, we would empty the machines out on a counter about the size of this table, and the quarters would, would oh, be two or three inches high. And we would count them like this, and we had to put them in quarter rolls, and we would take them to the, to the bank. Well, uh, after a while, at the first, when I first opened the business, I was there for, uh, it opened at 11 o'clock in the morning, and it closed, uh, I think it was either midnight or 1 a.m., and I was there for the whole time, seven days a week. But after about two weeks, I had made enough and felt that it was going to be profitable enough that I hired my first employee. Uh, who was a fellow by the name of Errol Brown. He was six foot five, about 260 pounds, a big black guy. And I said, well, why do you want to work in an arcade like this? And he had asthma badly, so he couldn't do any type of heavy labor or anything, and he was looking for a job. He was kind of an intellectual, kind of a revolutionary, mm -hmm. and he liked to read uh, his books, and basically he made change and kept order. No one messed with him and uh, uh, read uh, during the, during the workday. And he stayed with me until the very end, which I'll get to in just a second. Uh, I actually was able to hire another, a couple other people uh, as well. And I expanded to two other arcades uh, by uh, uh, the end, both located in different parts of Kansas City. The two other arcades didn't do well at all, uh, not like the first one. But in any event, after about a year and a half, um, my landlord was starting to get complaints about the type of clientele that were frequenting my establishment. Incidentally, the name of my place was the 39th Street Phantasmagoria <laughs> and Pinball Emporium. So um, this was in a transitional neighborhood, and there were a lot of elderly people living in apartments uh, in the area and they were complaining that it was, they, they were scared to walk the streets. As it turns out, I learned after the fact that there was prostitution running out of this arcade, there was drug dealing, um, big time drug dealing, and uh, uh, finally my landlord said, you know, we don't need this here, and he gave me 30 days notice, which was all that was required of the contract, and I had to close up and end it. So there went my, uh, a foray into my retail business. Uh, I knew that I probably wasn't going to do this the rest of my life, but it was a, it was a great gig while it lasted. Uh, then, uh, when I was living uh, on uh, 39th Street in this apartment, I met, a, met another fella who was an intern at one of the local hospitals, or I'm sorry, he was a resident, and uh, he, was, he uh, just finished his residency, and he got his first job as a civilian um, doctor at the Almeida Naval, uh, Naval Base in uh, San Francisco, just outside of San Francisco. And he was there for a while, and uh, we talked frequently, and he said, you know, I don't know anyone out here. I'm lonely. He said, if you want to come out here, I will pay the rent. All you have to do is pay for your food and incidentals. So I thought that was a good deal. 
And I thought that I would go out there and write the great American novel. So I went out there, and I was out there for about three months. And I had a lot of fun. Uh, first of all, I couldn't find a job out there, so that was a bad thing. But I started going to Stinson Beach, which is just north of San Francisco, near Muir Woods. <laughs> And uh, I would go there and I would lay on the beach all day and talk to people. I didn't get much of my novel written. In fact, I got very little of it written. And finally, I ran out of money. So I had to put my uh, tail between my legs and I came back to Kansas City and moved in with my parents, which unlike today, I was anathema to someone my age. I couldn't wait to get out of my house and to come back was really, uh, demoralizing for me. Uh, so uh, I knew that my stay there would be short-lived and so I needed a job. I went down and took the service, uh, civil service exam and um, uh, the first interview I got was at the Jackson County Jail as it was called at the time. I went down for the interview and it was a you know basically a conversation about you know my background and, and, and so forth. And then at the end of my background, um, at the in, end of the interview, the person that was interviewing me threw a shiv on the, on the table. A shiv is a, a, a makeshift knife that uh, inmates uh, uh, make frequently and then they get in fights or kill someone. But anyway, he throws this on the table and he says, he says, you, you know what that is? I said, it looks like some sort of weapon. He said, are you afraid of that? And I said, yeah, I'm afraid of that. He says, okay, you're hired. And that was it, and I started like the next day. And I worked as a guard in the, in the jail for about, I want to say, 14 months. It may have been a little more, a little less. Um, and during that period of time, uh, the Jackson County Jail became the Jackson County Department of Corrections, and guard Robert Bohm became a correctional officer. It was the same institution, and I had the same job, just the title and the name of the institution changed. But that was the beginning of criminal justice, and uh, the uh, you know, jails became departments of corrections, and prisons were associated yeah. with departments of corrections and so forth. Well, after about 14 months, um, they, start, they got a federal grant, the jail got a federal grant to start the first county level work release program. And they needed a psych someone with a psychology background to create a motivational course for the inmates who were gonna go out on work release. The idea was to, uh, they should go through like, it was about a two week course every day where they would uh, learn some, you know, uh, uh, set goals and, and um, what it takes to uh, uh, get and hold a job, uh, and basically just general motivation to live a law-abiding life. And uh, because I had a bachelor's degree in psychology, uh, they offered me the job, and frankly, I didn't know what I was going to do or what I was going to teach. Excuse me. So I uh, went over to the uh, downtown library, which was across the street from the jail then, and I started reading uh, books, uh, psychology, mostly psychology books that I had been introduced to uh, in um, college. And one of the books that I uh, uh, used was Abraham Maslow's uh, a book on uh, the hierarchy, of, the hierarchy needs. of needs. And I based this program on Maslow's hierarchy of, of needs. And on the other, the other uh, big influence on this program was Seymour Halleck's uh, 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 adaptations to uh, feelings of helplessness caused by some form of oppression. Well, I crafted together this course and then I, uh, I, I uh, taught it uh, to the, uh, to the inmates, uh, and I did this for about seven months. And during this period of time, the, um, law, uh, the uh, Congress created the law, Insist law Enforcement Assistance Administration, and one of their first projects was LEAP, which was an educational program for in-service personnel. 
And the idea was that in-service personnel uh, could uh, advance their educations because at that time, um, police departments, uh, correctional departments, uh, all you really needed was a high school uh, diploma and you could get a job. And the idea was that if, the, uh, if, if uh, criminal justice personnel were more educated, they could do a better job. So because I was working at the jail at the time, I qualified for a LEAP grant. Uh, well, actually it was a LEAP loan. Uh, and uh, the deal was that they would pay for your education and that if you worked in the criminal justice field, they would forgive your loan 25% a year for four years. Okay, so uh, through this program, I got my master's degree at University of Missouri at Kansas City and also my PhD at Florida State University. Um, they, they provided me tens of thousands of dollars to complete my education. And then when I received my PhD and got my first job at Jacksonville State University, after the first four years I taught there, they forgave my loan because teaching was included as a, uh, as a way of uh, paying off your uh, loan. So, how, so I guess I have a two-part question. So why secondary education as a master's? And then how do you get from secondary education all the way over into criminology? Good question. Well, the reason that I uh, majored in secondary education because my plan at that time was that I would teach in the high school, teach in high school, I was gonna teach psychology and sociology in a high school, and more importantly, I was gonna coach the ball teams. Uh -huh. That was my goal. I wanted to coach football, and basketball, and baseball at the high school level, so that's why I got my degree in secondary education. Now, because I had a bachelor's degree in psychology, I needed some sociology courses, and one of the courses I took was called Crime in the City. It was, uh, the teacher was Tom Carroll, who was a very interesting character, and uh, uh, he uh, took a liking to me, and I did very well in the course. I was highly motivated. Well, and also, because when I, I was working at the jail at the same time, I was on the B shift. So I worked from three to 11 at night, and because most things, uh, 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 you know, uh, calm down uh, after we served dinner to the inmates at about five o'clock, I had the evening basically to study. So I was able to you know, do very well in my classes and you know, sort of kill two birds with one stone. And so I was taking this uh, criminology course from him. I remember we read like uh, 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 Helter Skelter and uh, uh, Truman Capote's Cold Blood, In Cold Blood, these books just were coming out at that time. Uh, and uh, I found it very interesting. And uh, so um, uh, uh, Professor Carroll says to me, he says, I see that you're interested in teaching. Did you ever give any thought to teaching at the university? Uh, he said that, you know, it's a very nice lifestyle. And, uh, you know, I, I, he highly recommended it to me. And that was basically the first time I ever thought of teaching at the university level. Um, and that based upon what he described as his lifestyle, you know, teaching a couple classes a, a, a semester and doing research and writing, and I always like to write, um, it, sounded, uh, it sounded intriguing. I, I really liked your decision-making process yeah. uh, on Florida State. You had me laughing when I read that it was half, a half an inch on the a map. A quarter of an beach, inch. From, from the beach. Well, you got to remember, <laughs> back in, uh, night, it was about 1974, that I was applying for PhD programs, and there were only about a half a dozen then, and now there's dozens of them. But the only PhD programs that were in existence then were uh, like John Jay, uh, all but SUNY Albany. Um, you said Berkeley, but Ber they, had been, they had been shut down. They had just been yeah. shut down. I got a very nice letter from them saying that uh, they were impressed with my credentials, but they were no longer taking doctorals candidates because uh, Governor Ronald Reagan shut down their uh, their program and so having grown up in the, uh, so one of the other uh, 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 schools that had a, a PhD program was Florida State and being a Midwest boy never seeing the ocean uh, I saw where Florida State on the map was about a quarter inch to the Gulf 
and I it's, it's warm. I don't have to worry about winters anymore. I said, that's where I'm going. And that's the way I made the decision. I, you know, I was so naive in those days. I had no idea that the school that you went to made a yeah. difference or, or what you got your degree in made a difference or, or who you studied with yeah. made a difference. I, I learned all of that after the fact, you know. So anyway, I was just pleased to get to Florida State and um, uh, that's where, uh, just before then, I had met my wife now of yeah. 42 years. Uh, we met in Kansas City, actually only about two miles uh, north of here, down in the River Key. And uh, we met, and it was one of those love at first sights, and we had been together forever since, for 42 years. And she has been with me. Uh, we went to Florida State together. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a second. Um, but she has, we started out with nothing. I mean nothing. No assets at all. And that everything that I have done, everything that I have achieved is directly uh, responsible for. She has been my uh, inspiration. She has been my support uh, uh, person. Um, and so uh, we have, uh, fortunately, over the last 42 years, we've been very lucky and successful, and we've, we've been able to establish a very nice lifestyle for ourselves which is all, the, all that much nicer because we started out with nothing together and now we have what we have together. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm very thankful that I happened to go to, uh, down to the River Key that night where I met her. Moving from quarters to, to a little bit more uh, right. better on the pay scale. <laughs> right, right. So anyway, uh, we went, I, I moved down to Florida State and while she was still working in Kansas City and I got us an apartment right across the street from Tennessee, Ab uh, from Tennessee Avenue, right behind the Roman Catholic Church, there was this apartment complex, and I got us a two, no, it was a one-bedroom apartment um, with a little galley kitchen, a little living room, I think it was 800 square feet, and, uh, which was very small. And, um, and uh, then, then uh, she came down, and when she saw it, oh my God, she was so disappointed because she brought a little furniture down. Most of her furniture wouldn't fit in there. There was like a little love seat that we used a couch that would fit in there, but about everything else uh, she had to get rid of. And um, so we moved in there. It was a, it was a concrete block uh, building. And because of the heat and humidity down there, that twice a year they would uh, the uh, uh, manager would come in and wipe down the walls with bleach because they would get mold on them. Uh, and of course, you'd smell the bleach for a few weeks afterwards while you were airing it out. I'm imagining writing a dissertation under the influence of <laughs> right. bleach. Right. Well, I didn't do it much there. Yeah, right. Right. Another lucky thing was that in my same in the same apartment complex. Uh, I became friends with Ray Paternoster, uh, and uh, he was a year ahead of me, and uh, he sort of guided me in, uh, through the doctoral program until he left for his first job at, at South Carolina. So when I was at Florida State, because I didn't have a criminology or criminal justice background, I ended up taking 120 quarter hours of courses. I, had to, I took all of these criminology, criminal justice courses, and because I was really interested in theory, I took theory courses in the economics department, in the sociology department, and the psychology department, um, just so that I could get a broad overview of social science theory, uh, of which you know criminology is just a, a small part. I also took about a half dozen statistics courses because everyone told me that you know to be a good academic. A successful academic, you had to be statistically savvy, and so I took everything from non-parametric statistics to there was a whole course on analysis of variance. Uh, I took course uh, separate courses on multiple regression, and this was the before the days of logistic regression and so forth. And in fact, you were supposed to have working knowledge of a foreign language, but when I got down there, they said we could substitute. A computer programming language, um, Fortran, for one of the for, for one of the foreign languages, and so I did that. I learned Fortran, which you know is very useful now, um, or or in my career, 
And I remember that when we we started doing you know statistical analysis, uh, we were still um, uh, create uh, using cards, IBM cards that you had to punch, which were really a pain because if you got a comma in the wrong place, that would throw off the whole program, and then you had to find it, redo it, and then rerun it. And the computers were not nearly as fast as they, they were. They would have these huge mainframes in an entire building that you would have an access to a card reader and you you know, and then you get your printouts on the on the little green, you know, papers and so forth, and then you'd read your read your data and, and analyze it. So anyway, I was there for three years and then I went on the job market ABD. Now I, you know, after that I advised all my graduate students that if you can afford it and you can do it, you should complete your degree before you take your first job because there'll be so much, so many demands on you as a young assistant professor that I know so many people that are that have remained ABDs that never finished their dissertations just simply because uh, they had like four courses a semester, new, all new preps. They had to do committee work and. Uh, and all sorts of things like that. Now I think that they're a little nicer to their uh, young faculty members and give them some breaks. But when I went to Jacksonville State, um, that was my first job. I went there as ABD. And at the time, the going rate for a, young, a new green assistant professor was about $15,000 a year. But I went to Jacksonville State, and for some reason, when I interviewed with the dean who recruited me, Tom Barker, who's a former president of the uh, of ACJS, he was the dean of the College of Criminal Justice. We had a college, it, you know, it was more like a department, but they, it was a separate college, and he was a separate dean, and he was the most powerful dean on the campus there, so that was nice. And um, so uh, he hired me. And when I met the uh, provost and I met the president of the university, uh, they were uh, very enamored by the fact that I was Jewish. And I would be the first Jewish faculty member on this campus. And in fact, the president of the university didn't ask me any like relevant questions for the job. He, told, he sat there and for a half hour told me about his trip to the Holy Land. You know, and okay. And so, he, so, he, so the president tells Barker, who was going to offer me $15,000 a year to, you know, get Baum. We, we want him on this faculty. Uh, so the provost offered me $22,500, which was like one of the highest salaries of anybody that was coming out my year back in 1979. And so uh, I accepted the job, but that was for a 12-month contract. So I was obligated to teach four, course, four courses during the fall semester, four courses during the spring semester, one course during a mini-mester, which was between spring and summer. It lasted for a month, and you would teach one course five days a week for two hours a day. And then I was obligated to teach two courses during the summer semester. So I taught 11 courses a year for 10 straight years. Um, Yet still managing to publish. It's still managing to publish. So when young faculty cry to me about, you know, they have so much work to do, they can't get that publication out and whatever, I tell them my story about I was able to publish, I got tenure, I got promoted, and I taught 11 courses a year for 10 straight years, my whole, my whole tenure at Jacksonville State. Well, Tom Barker was very active in ACJS at the time, and he got me active in ACJS and also the Southern Criminal Justice Association. And I was very young. Uh, I, uh, he said, you know, you need to run for office. And I didn't have a presence uh, in the Southern region, but I had a little bit of presence uh, in, in nationally because my, my first publication but uh, my first two publications were out of my dissertation. My first publication was called Reflexivity and Critical Criminology, and I presented it at an ASC meeting. And it just so happened that Gary Jensen, who is a famous yeah. uh, criminologist, I think he was at Arizona at the time, yeah. um, 
Now, he happened to have been in the audience, and he said, he came up to me afterwards, and of course I was, you know, flattered and, and impressed. And he said, "That's very interesting uh, 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 paper, Bob. I am uh, uh, doing a reader for Sage on the sociology of delinquency, and I think that." you know, your presentation would make a nice chapter in my book. Would you be willing to contribute? At the time, I had not a single pu uh, publication. In fact, when I left my PhD program, I didn't have a single publication, unlike today where they come out with five or six or more publications, you know. But it wasn't unusual back then to come out without any publications. So anyway, this was my very first publication in Gary Jensen's Reader, Sociology of Delinquency, and I was thrilled to have this publication. Now, in retrospect, I realize that maybe I could have had it published in Criminology or something, which would have even been better, but I didn't know any better at the time, and so that was my first publication. And then I wrote another article out of my dissertation. My dissertation was called Radical Criminology and Explication in the Critique. And at that time in the late 70s, uh, radical, which is now called critical criminology, which, was, which I think is really a misnomer, but in any event, um, was just uh, being introduced into our field. Now there was radical sociology at the time, and, and it had a presence in other disciplines. This is sort of a neo-Marxist perspective. Did it have a presence at FSU? Uh, no. Not so who chaired? Who chaired? Right. So um, after I, you know, so when I, when I got most of the required courses done, then I was just taking courses that I needed. And uh, originally, my, my dissertation director initially was C. Ray Jeffrey. Oh. Um, who had just published in 1977 his Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design, which was very heavy on psychobiology, which he was really into. And my having a you know, psychology background, uh, I was drawn to him and his theory uh, and found it very interesting. In fact, I took his course for credit and then I sat through it again just because I thought I wanted to you know, absorb more of what he was talking about. Then I took my second criminological theory course, I took from Ted Shirikos, and that was a sociological criminology course with heavy emphasis on labeling theory, which was real big then, and uh, he was very much into that, doing a lot of uh, good research in that area with Gordon Waldo and others. And uh, uh, then I realized that in terms of my theoretical interests, and remember, I had that experience working at the jail, so I had uh, experience interacting with, uh, uh, with offenders, and I uh, you know, drew, was able to draw some conclusions about uh, uh, causes and so forth. And then I found that after taking both the sort of psychobiological perspective and the sociological perspective, I found that the sociological uh, perspective had more explanatory power, at least for me. And then you had all that economics. That and then I had the economics yeah. and, and, and other, so, other theory. Um, and so, um, so I started leaning that way, and then I uh, switched my dissertation director from C. Ray Jeffrey to Ted Shirikos, which was not an easy thing to do. I still remember I had lunch with C. Ray Jeffrey to tell him that I wasn't going to be his student and that I was gonna go over to Ted Chiricus. Well, Ted, Ted Chiricus and C. Ray Jeffrey did not like each other at all. And so, you know, he tried to talk me out of it, but I had already made up my mind. And from then on, through the rest of my career, until his death uh, years ago, that uh, he never liked me, he never gave me the time of day, he just wrote me off. And, uh, well, that's how things go sometimes. So as I look at your CV, some people will go through the process of kind of having a tagline on the front page of their CV. This is 
These are my areas of interest. Right. So I'm kind of imputing in a bit of a way here. Right. So forgive me if I've sure. mis, uh, misapplied a, a particular rubric here. I see a couple of, of themes kind of running through the body of your work. Uh, capital punishment seems to be a very much mainstay. The critical criminology is very much, it may undergird it or not, mm -hmm. uh, but it, there is a definite and right. a distinct presence of that. And then there's uh, a fixation or a concentration on abiding myths or public misperceptions. Right. Now, would you, uh, first of all, is that an accurate characterization? And then secondly, do you see this as all part of one omnibus thing that you are focusing in on and these are subparts, or are these sort of distinct and separate uh, entities? Well, that's, that's a good question. Um, well, I, I sort of consider myself, uh, uh, first of all, I consider myself a theorist. That was my first love, if you will. And I have always considered myself a critical criminologist. You were asking me before how I start, you know, uh, learning about uh, this infant field of critical criminology. Well, I talked Ted Shirakos into uh, doing a seminar on what we called radical criminology at the time. And we read like the early Marx, the philosophical manuscripts, the German ideology, and some of this, which Bonger? is- Bonger? Pardon me? Bonger? Well, we read Bonger, yeah. but, but, it, but he wasn't that big of an influence. Um, and then we read Quinney, who was a huge influence. He, he just had come out with Critique of Legal Order and uh, 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 Class, State, and Crime, uh, which were huge influences on me. In fact, at my uh, dissertation defense, they asked me if we could hire one person to the faculty at FSU, who would it be? And I recommended Richard Quinney. Um, but another person uh, outside of the criminological field that had a big influence on me was the sociologist Alvin Gouldner. Um, he was at Washington University in St. Louis at the time. He wrote The Coming, the Coming Crisis, Crisis of Western no. Sociology in the Dialectic of Ideology and Technology and a couple of other books that I read very carefully and had tremendous influences on me. And that's sort of where I got into the myth idea, you know, the myth thing that so much of what we think is true about criminal justice is really myth. You know, like, for example, that the police solve crimes. Well, the police don't, aren't very good at solving crimes, but they've never, that's never been their major uh, focus. You know, only about 10 percent of a police, uh, uh, you know, a police department's time is spent uh, uh, solving crimes. Uh, the rest of it's, you know, public service and uh, uh, order maintenance and that sort of thing. So anyway, so I got the idea, and actually at the time, Hal Popinski, uh, who was a friend, good friend of mine, and Paul Jessolo came out with their uh, Myths About Crime book, and that, uh, that was an influence on me, but it only covered like maybe six or eight myths, and I wanted to expand on that. And so I started writing in that area. You, you have a paper where you, you list 43. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so I, I explore that uh, uh, to a large extent. And in fact, my introduction to criminal justice textbook, which I'm just now completing the ninth edition of, um, uh, is it's basically, uh, uh, if it had a subtitle, it would be myths about criminal justice because I have, as one of the uh, margin features, are myth fact boxes about different acts, aspects. And I state the myth and then I state the fact, you know, or the presumed fact. And uh, it's all throughout the book. And so that topic, that area has served me well. Uh, so I consider myself a generalist because in, in doing the introduction to criminal justice, I've had to explore many different areas, many of which I really had no interest in, but I had to develop uh, some, you know, a, a fair knowledge about because uh, I needed the, those areas in my, uh, in my textbook. Um, as far as the theory is concerned, again, my first love, and throughout my career, I've uh, written theory. Uh, uh, I, have a, I have a theory book that, uh, is, uh, that is in its fourth edition. In the first three editions, I did myself, and that was with uh, first Wadsworth and then Cengage. And now, uh, then, it, uh, then now it's with Carolina Academic Press. And I have a co-author now, Brenda Vogel, who's at uh, California State University uh, in, um, uh, where is it? in Long Beach. 
and uh, uh, she needed a, a book publication for her going up uh, for full professor. She was a master's student of mine at UNCC. She says, I have a lot of good ideas for you. I use your theory book. I have a lot of good ideas for it. Uh, would you consider me coming on as a co-author? I said, well, I don't know. Let me think about that. And I thought about it for a while. I said, well, I'll tell you what. You write a chap, update it, revise a chapter for me, and let me see, uh, see uh, what kind of work you produce. And so I gave her a chapter, and she revised it, and she did a nice job, and I said, okay, I'll let you co-author my book. And so I uh, moved it over to Carolina Press, and so her name is on the fourth edition, and it will be on it from now until eternity. And you've written, uh, I want to get around to the Capital Punishment piece okay. here, too, because you've written quite a bit on it. Right, uh, right. One of my favorite titles here, Death Quest. And, right, uh, right. America's Experiment with Capital Punishment. Right. Uh, so how yeah. does this fit? Okay. In the early 1980s, I was reading the newspaper at the time in Jacksonville, as I always have done, and uh, I came across a little article that indicated, that it was a Gallup poll, that indicated that 75% of the American public supported the death penalty at that time. I found that interesting because I was, you know, being a, a critical theorist, a conflict theorist, I was surprised that the American public could, have, that large a percentage of the American public could agree on anything, uh, least of which is the, you know, the death penalty. So I thought it would be interesting to find out why such a large percentage of the American public support the death penalty. So I started researching that area and what became known as the Marshall Hypothesis. Because in his firm, in his, in his firm in opinion, uh, uh, former Justice Thurgood Marshall uh, wrote that he believed that the reason such a large percentage of the American public supports the death penalty is because they are ignorant about it. They just don't know anything about it. And furthermore, he believed that if the American public was educated about the death penalty, most people would oppose it. Unless, that is, they supported the death penalty primarily for retributive me, uh, reasons, and he didn't believe that uh, a change was very possible with people that uh, supported it for retributive reasons. That's an emotional uh, issue, not a cognitive one uh, that you could appeal to through reason. And, I've, and I, in my subsequent research, I found that to be yeah. true. Uh, anyway, so I, I, I reviewed the literature, and at the time there were only... I think there were three or four studies that tested the Marshall Hypothesis, and all of them were based on a methodology that was a pre-test, post-test, and then they would have them read uh, a couple articles or maybe just uh, excerpts of articles about the death penalty on a particular viewpoint or what have you, and they would test them pre on what their opinion was and, you know, some other questions. And then they would, after they read the article, or in one case it was even a book, um, they would get, uh, administer a post-test and see if their death penalty changed, and then they presumed that if there was change, it was a result of their reading this material. Well, that wasn't a very strong methodology because, you know, you, know, you didn't know if they had read the material, you didn't, you know, uh, uh, basically... Um, uh, uh, reading that little material is not enough really to form an intelligent opinion. Uh, uh, one of them, one of the experiments even allowed them an hour's worth of discussion, but that of course is not very good because one person could dominate the discussion, uh, other people could be intimidated. So, so anyway, I decided that I needed a, um, a, a, a more valid uh, uh, form of um, oh, um, stimulus, a stimulus. And so I decided I would create a death penalty class. And so I did. I created a course packet with all of these uh, readings from uh, um, various sources. And I taught a one of these mini-mesters at Jacksonville State, which was, again, uh, a course was offered in what would be the May term for a, for a month, five days a week for two hours a day. So I taught this course on the death penalty, and then I pre-tested them at the beginning of the course and at the end of the semester, where I knew they had been exposed to 
a lot of information about the death penalty. In fact, I tell my students after they've taken my death penalty course, I said, if nothing else, you're going to be amongst the most informed people about the death penalty in the entire world, and especially about the American death penalty. So I did this for, for a number of years, and, and then I, uh, I, I, I ran different uh, variations of this study. Like sometimes I had them uh, 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 voice their opinion on a, on a, a daily basis on the cl each class to try to pinpoint the per specific stimuli that affected their opinion. And the journals and the... the right, and then I had them do journals yeah. so that I could get a more qualitative yeah idea of what's influencing their opinion. So I, had all these, I did a lot of, uh, of these studies during the 80s and 90s, and um, fortunately they were published. You know, of course, I had the bane of the student sample, yeah. but student, students are human beings, and students do have death penalty opinions, and so at least it was better than nothing, and it got a general idea. And frankly, when you compare them to the distributions of death penalty opinions found in like Gallup polls and so forth, they were pretty close, you know, so that was a way of corroborating that the students were not just, you know, off the wall when it came to their opinions. So anyway, I was using these course packets uh, for, I don't know, at least five or six years. And then um, uh, I decided, well, you know, these course packets are pretty well developed. Maybe I should uh, turn them into a book. And in fact, it turns out that every course I taught, I ended up writing a book based upon the notes that I had developed over time. Uh, and so that, you know, uh, later in my career, every time I co every course I taught, I used the book that was that I wrote. And it's funny that some students knew who the author of their textbook was, and some of them didn't know who the author of their textbook was. So anyway, so I have the textbook now that I'm using as my stimulus in these studies. And subsequently, then a lot of other people picked up on the methodology, and there are now dozens of studies uh, using college students uh, gauging various aspects of, of death penalty opinion. So that was, that was the basis of Death Quest. The reason why I named it Death Quest because I was wondering, again, my whole basis was why people were supporting the death penalty, why the quest for the death penalty. And originally I was gonna, I did a death quest one, and I was gonna death do quest two. death two, death quest yeah. three, and then in the fourth edition, the publisher said, why don't we just simply say the fourth edition rather than death quest four, because no one would know what that was, and so the fourth and fifth edition are fourth and fifth editions rather than death quest four and five. So by my count, uh, there are 32 books that you've authored, co-authored, edited, or co-edited. If you can count right. multiple editions. And multiple editions over the course of time that allow you an opportunity to kind of update and uh, right. include progressions. You've done dozens of uh, book course of the years uh, explicating various aspects of the, the death penalty scenario as well as the mythology and uh, the other aspects. And of course, the, the journal articles that we sort of the bread and butter in terms of the tenure progression. Right. Right. Uh, looking back on all of the work that you've and the output that you've produced, are there a few that you look back to with you know, kind of a, a special fondness, uh, I, I, or I, ones that you think resonated? Uh, I think well, I you know, and this is sort of a, a lesson for young assistant professors, is that so often careers just take unexpected turns. There's a lot of serendipity in the academic profession. Frankly, I never thought that I would spend. Uh, the bulk of my career on the subject of the death penalty. I thought I would essentially look into this issue of the basis of death penalty opinion, and then I would move on and, and really focus on my critical criminological work. But things tend to snowball, you know, and you get identified with the subject, and then you start getting asked to write chapters, and then there's a you know there are different variations and aspects of what you're interested in, and so this became um, this became a part of my reputation, and I'm probably best known for my death penalty uh, work, and it also kind of worked out for me in terms of my progression through academia. Um, you know, critical criminology is sort of a fringe field in the field, and frankly, if you're a critical criminologist, you can have a difficult time 
in progressing uh, through the field because especially like today where there is a, a dominance of the conservative political viewpoint, uh, someone who's actually left a liberal is, uh, uh, is uh, looked down upon. Um, and so if I had just focused on critical criminology and didn't have this all of this death penalty work, I may never have been promoted to full professor. I may, may not have gotten tenure, although I probably would have gotten tenure just on, on the work that I had done. So uh, the capital punishment work really had served me well because that was more mainstream, more accepted, and uh, again, most people don't even associate me with critical criminology, most particularly other critical criminologists. Uh, uh, um, uh, You've also engaged uh, over the course of time uh, in a couple of sort of back and forth within the literature. Um, there are a couple that are that are on the record here. Uh, a back and forth with Samson and Groves. A back right. and forth with uh, Schwalier uh, and Fredericks uh, are the ones that I, I've been able to detect. Uh, now, Chris give, Eskridge too. Uh, okay, we'll put him on the list <laughs> as well. Can you give us a little bit about? Uh, the, the tenor of the debate and how you think it actually ultimately shook out. Well, you know, I've always been willing, uh, I've always enjoyed mixing it up with people. Yeah. I, I like arguing and debating and so forth. And each of these people came out with uh, uh, positions on a particular area, uh, oftentimes published in like the criminologist, um, that, uh, that I took issue with. And that I made a counter argument and uh, I think I stated the position well. I'm not embarrassed by any of my uh, counter arguments. Uh, I think they were, frankly, very persuasive, and a lot of people have told me that they were very persuasive. I didn't set out to embarrass anyone. Uh, I just set out to, to I just set out to uh, to express an alternative view, and I think that's what we should do in this field. I mean, you know. Uh, if we're all on the same side, if we're all in the mutual admiration society, then our field's not going to progress very well. But it's the it's the analysis and critique and debate that moves ideas along and moves the field along. So I enjoyed uh, doing those, um, but I, you know I, I thought very carefully about them, and I hopefully I presented them in ways uh, that didn't uh, belittle or uh, harm well, the people that I worked. That I was critiquing. Well, one of them I think is, is particularly illustrative. It, it came out at a particular point in time. I, I believe ASC took a particular position, offered a policy statement, right. uh, which it's, it's generally reluctant to do on, on capital punishment. Right. And so it brought into the fore this issue of uh, policy advocacy versus science as sort of yes. the descriptive element and nothing more. Could you give us a little bit about uh, sure. figuring out ways to kind of navigate that? that tricky boundary? Well, I, you know, again, I, I, I think I've all, you know, as a critical criminologist, um, you know, it, it's important not only to talk about uh, issues or social problems, including crime and such, but it's also important to be actively involved, to be a change agent. So policy has always been very important. In fact, my theoretical, I, I frankly, I think the theoretical work is useless unless it has policy implications. Um, and so that's, uh, that was uh, very uh, important to me. I remember when ASC took the stand on the death penalty, I think it was 1992, and Joan Peter Celia was president when the ASC board voted based upon the evidence at that time, and it was very narrow, that they could not support the argument that the death penalty serves as a general deterrent. That's all it was. And uh, the membership voted, and uh, basically they had, uh, supported it, supported that statement, and adopted that uh, position. Um, but it was a very narrow position. And these organizations, ASC, ACJS, they're hesitant to take more significant positions on, on these issues because, of course, membership to these organizations is, 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 is varied. And you have people of all political persuasions from the very far right to the very far left and everybody in between. So if you were, if one of these organizations was take, to take a position uh, arguing for the abolition of the death penalty, for example, then you would probably lose a fair amount of membership over it. And none of these organizations uh, 
are willing, and nor, nor do I believe that they should, um, uh, take those types of positions to alienate a sizable proportion of the membership. Because again, if everybody has, shares the same perspective, then you lose that, uh, uh, those arguments and those counterpoints that make you think more, that make you hone your own arguments uh, better, and that move the argument along. So I think that's why these uh, professional organizations are unwilling to take more uh, policy, general policy-oriented right. uh, positions. Okay, especially on uh, divisive issues. I right, exactly. And, and, and especially in a more robust sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, thinking back on, on your career here, I, I, you actually have, uh, at a particular point in time, uh, your uh, Bruce Smith uh, Senior Award address, a great title to this. Low probability, nonlinear events over the life course of a criminologist. Uh, if you were to unwind the tape, uh, would you do anything differently in terms of staging uh, things? I, 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 you know, knowing what I know now, and again, as I said at the outset, I was very naive about yeah. academia. Um, I was the first person in my family to graduate from college, although my father was an attorney. But he came out of World War II and you didn't need a bachelor's degree to go to law school. He, he went to law school directly on the GI Bill and practiced for 50 years, hating every moment of it. But uh, he, he uh, practiced and he made a living and he supported his three children through college. We have lots of graduate degrees in my family. Uh, my brother is, uh, is, uh, is going to retire next year. He was an attorney uh, at, uh, in a, uh, a major law firm in New York City. He graduated Harvard Law School in Stanford. He got his bachelor's degree at Stanford. My sister has a two master's degree from the University of Denver in social work and public administration. So the Bone family well, may not be rich, but we got a lot of education and a lot of degrees. Um, but in any event, what was, I'm sorry. What so was, uh, if you were done one. Oh, if I was done one. Um, I, I'm not sure if I would have had the opportunity, I probably wouldn't have taken the job at Jacksonville State at my as my first university. I probably would have held out for a, a, a major universe, state university um, because when starting out at Jacksonville State, it made it very, very difficult to move from there. Um, uh, because it's a lower, considered a lower tier university. I mean, I applied after about the first three years there, I started applying for jobs elsewhere. And I never, in, in 10 years, nine years, I never even got an interview at another position, even though I had a publication record and I was becoming known in, in the field and so forth. I think primarily because of the uh, association with critical criminology. Uh, but I, I mean, I could paper this whole room with rejection notices. So, which again is another good lesson. You have to be tenacious. You have to be a persevere in whatever you want to achieve because no one's going to give you anything. So anyway, um, I uh, um, oh, I lost it again. So uh, uh, working at Jacksonville State, oh, to trying to build oh, so a I would I would have I would have held out, uh, hopefully uh, for. A, a, a more prestigious university. I probably, I, you know, if I could have afforded it, I would have stayed at Florida State and finished my dissertation, and then gone on the job market and hopefully go to some state university like some of the graduates had. And had I got done that, then I could have either stayed at that university or gone to another, uh, you know, a name, you know, a higher level university. But the only reason that I got out of Jacksonville State, and I was there for 10 years, in fact, I was vested in the Alabama retirement system that uh, took uh, 10 years to be vested. And when I turned 60, I started receiving a check, a small check, but a check from, uh, from Alabama be, uh, for retirement. Um, I said, well, you know, I'm only 60 years old, I'm still working. Um, can I postpone getting this check and maybe it'll accrue more interest and so forth? They said, no. He said, you start, you, you start earning your retirement when you're 60, so you can take it now or you don't have to, but you're not going to get any more money. So I said, send it on along. And so that was nice. But uh, I, I went from Jacksonville State to University of North Carolina at Charlotte. And the only reason I got that job was because the chair of that department was Ron Vogel at the time, who's gone on 
Uh, his last job was the provost of the California state uh, uh, system, the entire system, California state, uh, uh, not the university system, but the college, all the California state colleges. And he was the he was the highest academic officer. But at the time, he was the chair of the uh, criminal justice department at UNCC. And we had served on the, uh, 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 the uh, board of the ACGS. That's how we met each other. And we became friends. And then he had a position opened up at the associate level. And that, by that time, I was an associate professor. And he said, uh, Bob, would you be interested in the job? And I said, sure would. And uh, I, luckily, I was hired, and I ended up working there six years. And well, he had left subsequently, um, and that was an interesting story. But we'll leave that for sure, another sure. time. And um, so uh, I was uh, uh, offered a job at the University of uh, 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 Central Florida because uh, two of my friends. Uh, Belinda and Bernie McCarthy, Belinda had become the Dean of the College of Health and Public Affairs, which housed the Department of Criminal Justice, and Bernie McCarthy, her husband, had um, uh, assumed the chair of the Criminal Justice Department. Mm -hmm. I had worked with Bernie for nine years at Jacksonville State University, so we were friends, both he and his wife knew me well, and so they, uh, they had a position for a full professor, and they offered me the position, and it was a it was a, a big increase in pay, and it also was an opportunity to move to Florida, Orlando, uh, which was a great place to to go, and it it has been a great place to live. And so I took that job, and I've been there for 21 years up to my retirement uh, this past August. Uh, do you, would you have uh, along on the same tangent here uh, advice to sort of future viewers of this uh, this archive? Uh, any advice to those who have maybe a critical bent or a critical agenda on how to kind of bear that while yeah. having For, your scruples about you in terms of your academic identity but at the same time? Yeah, you better, be real, you better be real good. Yeah. You better be well published and you better know your, know your subject and also you better be able to know something beyond critical criminology because there aren't many courses on critical criminology in a regular curriculum. So you better be able to teach, uh, you know, nuts and bolts courses like introduction to criminal justice, or maybe a police course, or a, a corrections course, or a law course, or something like that. Now you could bring to bear a critical ideas to these courses, but you have to be able to teach the courses that are actually in the curriculum. You're you're no stranger to using data either. Oh no yeah. no yeah. no, uh, I use data when it's appropriate. You know, again, I was taught that you know the data shouldn't lead the question the research question the research question should determine you know what uh, method methodological technique you use and what statistics you use to analyze your your data so some of my research has been quantitative and i've used statistical anal the various statistical analyses and some of it's been qualitative and i've used those methodologies i took a course in qualitative methodology from tom blumberg uh, who went on to become dean at uh, uh, Florida State? I think he may still be. He's still there. And uh, uh, that was a that was a great course, very informative. And so I felt like I uh, uh, had a, 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 a terrific, a solid background in methodology and statistics. But again, the problem of so many young academics is they, ha the, especially working on their dissertation, they're given a data set, and then they go in search of a problem. They try to figure out, oh, how can I use this data set to uh, figure out a problem to write a dissertation, rather than figuring out what problem they want to pursue and then going out and searching for the data. But uh, again, it just depends on you know how you're trained, and uh, I find too often that uh, many young academics are well trained in statistics these days. They can schmooze data with the best of them. But they are theoretically uh, vacuous. They they don't have a good a theoretical background, uh, and they're not really good idea per people. Uh, they're technocrats. They you know uh, give them a give them a set of data. They'll crunch it for you. They'll analyze it for you. But in terms of uh, doing a problem from conceptualization to completion, there are not a lot of academics that are, have the wherewithal to do that well. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
we've talked a little bit about your Bruce Smith uh, Senior uh, Award address. Uh, maybe oh, that was, okay. now, now might be an, an appropriate time to talk about your, your presidential address uh, at now on the 30th anniversary of the, uh, the founding of the ACJS. It was entitled, appropriately enough, on the state of criminal justice. And there you outlined a, a kind of a, an, agenda. A, an important critique, I think, uh, of the field in terms of its limitations, of, uh, limitations in terms of educating. Right. Um, the wider public, and you spent a fair amount of time talking about the, the, the drug war and outlining a few critiques and mm -hmm. um, misperceptions and things. I'm wondering now, a couple of years removed <laughs> from, uh, from that particular point, um, what the state of the field is uh, with regard to achieving that agenda or that vision yeah. uh, that you thought was particularly important. Well, I think as far as the drug war is concerned, uh, I think we've made a lot of progress, and we now have, what, 25 states where legalization. Uh, it, um, at least medical, yeah. uh, uh, medical marijuana, and what, there are five states that have legalized yeah. it, and so it, uh, it's still, it's still a, 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 a um, what do you call it, a section one drug, I yeah. mean, our, yeah. a narcotic. Yeah, a narcotic with right. cocaine and heroin, it's still in that same class. And it appears that uh, our new Attorney General Sessions uh, seems to be indicating that he may uh, enforce the federal laws which the Obama administration had uh, backed off of. And so it's going to be interesting to see the federal-state uh, yes. interaction on this subject. But we do know that the vast majority of the American public feel very differently about uh, drugs, especially marijuana, than they did uh, back in 1993 when I was president of the organization. So, uh, you know, I mean, it, it was crazy back then. 50%, uh, and that's still true today, 50% of all federal prisoners are drug law violators. And back then it was like 25% of all state prisoners were drug law violators. Now I think it's down to like maybe 18%, I think the last time I, uh, I looked. But we're spending an awful lot of money incarcerating, and these are mostly marijuana users, not even dealers. So we spend an awful lot of money incarcerating these people who could probably be dealt with in a different fashion. Um, I've always advocated, as many other people, that drug, uh, uh, drug problems ought to be dealt, as, uh, dealt with as a social health problem, not as a criminal justice problem. So we've come a long ways in the last uh, uh, 24 years since uh, I was president of this organization. And we've come a long ways, uh, I also talked about capital punishment yes. in my uh, presidential address, and we've come a long way since 1993 in that area as well. So I feel fairly well vindicated uh, in uh, what I was proposing back then. I'm, you know, frankly, I'm disappointed in this very, uh, this move right in criminal justice uh, that um, I think is indicated by many, uh, many things, including the, um, the uh, uh, legitimation, if you will, of the biological perspective. Uh, now, uh, I think that there is room for uh, a biological perspective in criminological theory, but I think that in terms of explaining criminality or explaining the imprisonment problem, I think it explains a very tiny part of the variance uh, in the equation. And uh, seeing the movement right rather than left, uh, looking at uh, you know, problems of, uh, of uh, economics, wealth, uh, uh, standard of living, uh, health care, uh, all of these issues, education, that I think are, uh, explain much more variance than do, do uh, uh, brain patterns or, or home hormone imbalances or genetic uh, composition. Do, do you think that that goes back to that earlier issue that you kind of mentioned in a little bit of a way with this emotional versus cognitive kind of things in terms of political leanings no, or the way in which people frame? No, I don't think so because, again, I, the biological perspective is, is, is very heavily uh, 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 st uh, researched and there's a lot of good but statistical I mean, research I mean, supporting it. I mean in terms of uh, political leanings, in terms of policy preferences. Oh yeah, I, I think, and I think many of these biological criminologists don't even associate the political implications of their work uh, with their work. 
And, and I think that that's the difference between a, a critical criminologist and a positivist. Positivists do this work b believing they're value free, that they don't have really any policy implications, whereas a critical criminologist thinks that everything that we do is value laden. There's no such thing as objectivity in our work and that all of our work has policy implications, whether you know it or not, whether you're conscious of it or, or not. And so for a critical criminologist, uh, what the better ones believe is that, you know, you should be upfront about your uh, political biases so the reader of your work can judge it in the context of uh, the philosophical and political perspectives from where it's coming. Uh, looking out on the horizons here in terms of what would you uh, propose the field begin to look into with, with maybe greater depth? Um, well, again, I, I think that there is plenty for uh, criminology uh, to be uh, to be working on. And, and you know, in terms of the progress that we've made over the last you know 50 years, I mean, since criminal justice became a discipline, I guess in the, the president's report probably in the late yeah. 60s, yeah, early 70s, yeah. um, we haven't done it. We haven't really done much that we can. Uh, hang our hats on or be proud of. I mean, the, the prison population continued to increase to, to unreasonably high levels. Uh, we, had, we have uh, ab abnormally high recidivism rates. We're not keeping people out of prison. Um, uh, police, despite the different philosophies, whether community policing or CompStat or what have you, they're still having the same problems they've had during their entire history. In fact, in recent years, they've, came, they've become in more stark relief, the problems between the police and the communities, even having sort of instituted community policing over the last couple of decades. I'm thinking of a, there was a, you wrote a really clever paper, uh, a radical solution to the crime problem uh, that kind of harkens back to an earlier point in, in many different ways. And that you, you argued for full unemployment in that right. yeah, it was called the rise yeah, it was of the machines kind of thing that is kind of dominating the public discourse with AI, uh, right. artificial intelligence these days. Right. Uh, that, was, uh, that was one of my, you asked about my favorite papers. That yeah. was one of my favorite papers. Yeah. Uh, the, the title of it, you gave the subtitle, the title yeah. of it was Beyond Employment. Uh, because when it came out yeah. in the early, four, uh, the early 80s, right. there was a lot of research on the relationship between employment and crime. Yeah. And basically, I was writing a counter-argument saying that employment is not the solution to crime because in the not, not too near distant future, uh, human labor is going to be basically uh, superfluous. Yeah. That most of the uh, like manufacturing jobs, for sure, are going to be done by technology, by, by machines. And that they're going to be, you know, they're going to be jobs for uh, people to keep those machines running and everything. But the vast majority of the population are, is not going to be in a position to earn a living through employment. So what is beyond it? That was the theme of the, yeah. of the position. What is beyond employment? And we have to start thinking about that issue because eventually it's going to be here. Right now, we live in a country where the way a person uh, survives, uh, uh, makes a living, maintains a standard of living is basically through employment. And when that stops for most people, how are they going to buy the necessities of life? How are they going to live? And we're going, we as a society are going to have to come up with solutions to that. Yep. Yep. Uh, in reaching the conclusion point here, uh, thank you for the, the back and forth. Well, this, <laughs> has been, this has been terrific. Yes, it has. Uh, are there any questions that, or any issues or uh, topics that I have failed to raise that you think are, are important in no. terms of t telling the story of, of Bob Bones, <laughs> uh, the arc of, from pinball to uh, AI yeah, right. <laughs> and everything in between? Um, I, think you've covered, I think we've covered a, a, a goodly portion yes. of, <laughs> of that. Uh, I would just advise uh, all those people who are interested in going into criminal, uh, academic criminology and criminal justice or who are, who are young academics is to you know, keep yourself open to serendipity. Keep yourself open to new ideas and, and don't get fixated on a particular issue or, uh, or problem. And pursue whatever issue or problem that you're interested in with a critical mind. You should be, you should be your own biggest critic. 
before your work goes out to the world <laughs> to, uh, uh, to uh, examine. So I think that would probably be my best advice. But it's been a great life. Great career. I feel very fortunate, very lucky. I always say it sure beats laying tar on the highway. <laughs> and so I've been, uh, I've been very pleased, very fortunate uh, that I was lucky enough to uh, uh, fall into this field and to be able to uh, establish a career over almost 40 years. Well, uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. Uh, I suppose we'll sum it up with the we a little quip earlier about I said your city on the left, and you said always on the left. Right. <laughs> so thank you for your time. Thank it's you. It's been great. Oh, it has yes. been great. Thank you so much. <laughs>